space communication. These will be among the main topics for dialogue. Championing this idea of waste materials and um, secondhand sneakers, and I think it sort of leaves people to feel accountable for what they're making. Hey Helen, great to see you. Yeah, so lovely to finally be able to connect. Yeah, and you're in London. I am, in rainy London town. Rainy London, yeah, I've got the sun blasting my face here, so I, yeah, it's, it's uh, sunset time here. I mean, the weather's been pretty, uh, it's been raining a lot, it's kind of rainy season now, but it's been beautiful today, so yeah, blessed to be in Bali. So Helen then, so you're making sneakers from waste, which is amazing, and you've been doing this for, for quite a number of years now. And I think the work you're doing is really vital on a number of levels. Um, I mean, first and foremost, it just looks incredible. I think in terms of as a well-designed sneaker, I think it stands up to anything else that's going you know, on out there. And the fact that you know, you're using waste materials, the craft element, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing what you're doing. And in today's world, you know, mass consumerism, this sort of current linear system that we're in, clearly we need a huge rethink. Things just aren't working. And I believe your work is sort of giving us a glimpse into the future, um, whether it's from the craft end, you know, but, but also kind of very relevant in today's sort of cultural landscape in terms of the aesthetic as well. So just talk us through your process then in terms of how you're making this and maybe where you kind of started. Yeah, so thanks so much. I think um, it's kind of a number of things. So I started off, I sort of started this idea when I um, did my MA collection at the Royal College of Art and when I was there before that I studied traditional um, footwear and then when I was at RCA I really wanted to go into sneakers because it was something I didn't know how to make and um, I was just interested to find out how they were made so I started sort of um, trying to get people's shoes to take apart people's sneakers and I was asking my boyfriend you know oh, can I take your Air Maxes apart or whatever and he wouldn't give them to me and a lot of people I realised people had this sort of attachment to sneakers that they don't maybe have to other items of clothing. And people, even when they're completely battered and worn, people still love them and they wanted to keep them and cherish them. So that was sort of one of the first angles where I started to think, okay, there's something more to these products, especially worn products, than just, you know, to be thrown away and that's the end, that's the end of that. Um, so that was sort of the start in looking into worn and um, secondhand materials. So even though I've always been very environmentally conscious, I didn't actually approach the idea through the lens of wanting to reduce waste. I came through a much more story bed, story um, led sort of perspective and um, started to really think about that and people's journeys and how sneakers like they interact with people and, and all that sort of thing and then um i because no one would give me their sneakers to cut up i went to a recycling center in london called trade which i still work with now and sort of just said oh do you have any old sneakers because i want to cut them up i want to see how they're made and they just had so many <laughs> and i just was completely surprised I'd never really seen a recycling facility in use before and just the amount of donations that they got but also the the scale of the operation was just immense and they had basically these odd um sneaker or odd shoe bins and they're just these ginormous bins that um when they're sorting the stuff to see if they can resell or reuse or um donate or all these different things they're, they just have this massive conveyor belt and everything's just going, basically. So they're very quickly thinking like, oh, that's a pair, we'll use that, we won't use that. So if anything is odd, they just chuck it behind them 
and it goes into this odd sneak odd shoe bin basically um and that can be sometimes people that donate their shoes don't even um they might donate them as a pair but obviously when you're donating things into such a big vast vat of stuff they can get separated so i always try and encourage people to tie the laces together or like secure them in a way so you can see that like this is definitely a pair so anyway then um they were like yeah we have all this so i was like great i'll use that um and yeah i just i go there and i essentially sort through these massive bags and take just a tiny percentage of what they have um because i'm looking for quite specific things so sort of get the bits that i want and then um and then i take those as my raw materials so that's sort of how everything um started i guess and then what was the, the other things oh yeah and also in terms of design i think um so I kind of started from that process and then it was really the material that narrates the design. So it was always, um, you know, thinking about um, the pieces. I was deconstructing all the pieces, looking at the pieces and then using those as the direction for the design. So I think that's why when you see my work, it one doesn't look like anything else that really exists because it's not, I'm not copying anything or it's not like, I'm not even inspired by anything that exists i'm inspired by what's in front of me and the material so that always allows me to create these really um natural sort of organic patterns um it's sort of like building a collage really i'm just sort of collaging all these materials onto this shoe um and so that sort of helps to separate it as well i think from what what other people are doing which is nice yeah, you can really see that in your designs. It feels very honest and it's almost, it hasn't got that sort of try hard element of like, I'm trying to do something really deconstructed and crazy. It just feels very natural and it's a very hard thing to do. And a friend of mine, Ern Chen, who I know you, you made his uh, manifesto sneaker, uh, the brand is called Salvages. When he, when I first, when he showed me those at first, I was like, what, how, how did you do that? And then I found out you were the one that made them and I'd seen you on Instagram and I was like, wow, this girl is really talented and I was like, you know, I've been watching you since then. And, you, you know, somebody that's really um, interested in sustainable design, I just think it's so powerful what you're doing and it's so relevant to what people actually want to wear first and foremost because of the design. And by default, it's, it's, it's doing good for the environment. But it's crazy to hear that all of these sneakers are ending up in this, this, this place. And how are they collecting them then? Is there, is there a specific company that collects them or do they work with... Yeah, how, how did how are they going around collecting these waste sneakers? Where are they getting them from? So this uh, company that I'm working with, Trade, it's actually a charity. It's a sort of fashion-based charity. Um, so they all their campaigns go to help sort of like garment workers and things like that. So it's all um, based in fashion, which is why I like um, working with them. Um, but they have bins all around London and around the UK. So they have like donation bins and then people can donate um, their clothes in there. And then they have also a network of stores, uh, trade like charity shops. So their main goal is to try and take the donations and resell them in their charity shops. But then they also have, you know, other angles where they maybe take the clothes that they wouldn't sell in the charity shops. And they have like other levels of, of where those go to. But then, yeah, the single ones are just sort of left they actually there's actually a company that they work with that they send the shoe i can't remember where it is now in the world but they send the shoes the single shoes and there's actually a uh warehouse and they try and repair shoes from all around the world wow and i just when they told me that i was like please can i go like how could i go there that just sounds sounds like an epic scale um but yeah, so I take, so that's what they do with those single shoes. But then I take such a small percentage. I maybe take like 50 shoes every three months or six months or something. So it's, you know, when I'm there, they have these ginormous vats and I'm literally picking out a few shoes that I want. And it, it feels like I'm doing something useful, but really my, the scale of what, the scale of what I'm actually producing is small, but what I'm trying to do is sort of spread that message, which is on a bigger scale, I guess. Absolutely. And I think that's what's that's creating the impact. It's that sort of message and, and through, you know, today's technology of social media is it's spreading pretty fast, you know, so it's, it's it, as I mentioned, it's incredibly inv uh, vital and important the work you're doing. And I guess when people are recycling this, this like when you look at sneakers, it's made from so many different materials, right? It's not just one or two materials. It's 
it's it's I, I don't know how many. I mean, you could probably tell me better, but it seems that's the issue with recycling is the fact that we've just muddled all of these different materials together that shouldn't really go together. So it just makes it completely non-recyclable. Yeah, exactly. They do have so many materials in it. And then they also, um, I think the thing with sneakers is they kind of, um, there was a stage, not so much now, and I think partly because of sort of the trend of deconstruction that's come out of um, this sort of movement, which is a, another topic. But I think um, the sneakers back when I was d started this in, you know, 2015, 2016, they sort of appear on the shelf so shiny and white and like crisp and they're so devoid of making and i think that because i come from a traditional footwear background where you know you really know the craft of the making and you know that you know there's these british english shoe making factories that are making these beautiful shoes and then when you um when they come to like the end of life you can resole them and you can resell them up to three times um, I used to work in a shoe shop um, for a brand called Jeffrey West and we used to do resoles all the time. And I think that that uh, background for me really made me connect with that idea of like keeping the longevity of a of a shoe specifically. And um, and then when I looked at sneakers, I was like, they're just, you almost don't, you forget that they're made by humans. And I think um, it's a question that I get a lot with my shoes. People are like, oh, so they're handmade. Like, do you make them? And I, my, every sneaker you own is handmade and made by someone. It's just that because it's, because it's so polished, you've forgotten about the process of making. And so one of the angles of my work that I really wanted to try and get across was this idea of, really exaggerating and showing the process of making so you can see oh those are all the different materials those are the stitch lines there you can see i don't know the label from the inside of a shoe you can see the foam you can see the padding you can see the heel stiffener so all these materials that usually are completely hidden i started to expose to really show people all the work that goes into um sneakers but then obviously it comes with that, then you can see the amount of materials that goes into them as well. Um, but it's something now that there's a lot more availability for replacing those components with either more sustainably produced components or um, starting to simplify everything so you can have um, all, one, all one material, which I know, you know, like the... Uh, there's a couple of brands now that are doing those like one material uppers. Um, so yeah, there is solutions, but it's um, I think there's still a long way to go. Yeah, it seems to be. And the brands that I'm seeing who are doing things, I mean, even now the big players, the Nikes, the Adidas, they're doing the odd shoe, whether it's the Future Loop, which is made from one material, and we're seeing Nike doing the Space Hippie, but it's, I think it's just so kind of, it's so much in its infancy, and I think these brands are working out how are we going to scale this? How is this profitable? All these different questions. Um, but I guess at least they're thinking about it. I guess, I guess that's a good start. But, but you're right. When you do think about sneakers, you think of huge factories, big machines, everything just made in these vast sort of vortexes of, of, of sort of yeah, com computerized machines and not someone physically there yeah. with a sewn machine. Uh, whereas with shoes, you feel, you know, that leather, you know, making like uh the, the craft of making shoes you still kind of feel like somebody's made that so and that hasn't been translated into sneakers but when i look at your work clearly you can see that is made by hand and that's that's definitely a, a really cool component about what what you're yeah. doing but it's funny because you when, when we're talking about recycling and and this notion of sort of um repairing i mean i remember growing up in newcastle you know in the late 80s early 90s and I've got really good memories of going to the cobblers, like with my mum or my auntie. The, you know, everybody, I, I always remember everybody back then would always used to get their shoes repaired. And I don't know if that happens anymore. It doesn't, probably doesn't seem to be. Um, but, but yeah, I think there's, there's a lot to be said in that. And I wonder, because kind of these shoes generally are made from leather, uh, or these sole units are made from leather and they're getting repaired or whatever, like what, with what you're doing, do you feel there's something which people could almost look at doing in their own lives and looking at their cupboards and saying, okay, I've got, you know, some people have probably got hundreds of pairs of sneakers. Some people might have 15 pairs of sneakers or whatever. 
but that's enough to last you a lifetime. And you could essentially create a new pair of sneakers by reworking what you already have and it would last you forever. Do you think that's something, do you think that's where things are going to head? And how do you, do you see what you're doing um, becoming a bit of a sort of open source type of thing where people could learn from you, they could set up their own little sort of industries in their own communities and do this for people within their neighborhoods or something. Do you feel, do you feel that's where things are going to head to? Yeah, I think there's definitely an element of that. There's a few um, sort of things that are already, I guess, in play a little bit. But I think one of the most um, things that I find the most amazing is that idea of when people take that ownership into their own hands. So like I said, you know, my sneakers, they're very, they're made to order, they're bespoke, you know, they're quite, um, they're not very accessible to a lot of people. But what is accessible is that idea. And I think that when I get DMs from students or from from not not even students, you know, just from anybody that that's inspired by what I've done and that that's inspired them to increase the longevity of their own products. So maybe they thought, oh, yeah, I was going to throw these away, but then I painted on them or then I changed the laces or I cut a bit off or I stuck a bit on and they they've kind of been inspired by that mindset of taking some ownership of your products and also by um, seeing the value in your products that are a bit more worn. Because I mean, there's such a massive trend with vintage and secondhand um, in so many other aspects. And I think in in shoes, sometimes that doesn't really um, translate, but obviously vintage sneakers is a massive um, industry as well. And I think that for people to sort of see their own journey and their own, um, sort of human agency on the products as the beauty of it is really important. And I think that's that's sort of a few, you know, some of my audience are sort of changing their their mindset in that way, which is really nice. Um, and then also I do do um, workshops and things like that. So I try and teach this sort of design thinking in the hope that um, it will spread. Because I think, like you said, it should be the future and I think that idea of repairing um we've sort of forgotten because everything just suddenly you know got so mass produced and mainstream that um we didn't need to repair anything anymore because we could just get an it was you know cheaper to buy another pair than than to get it repaired so you know that idea of repair and the cobblers are sort of a bit of a dying art um but I do know there's a local cobbler um, who I go and visit sometimes in in Hackney Central and he um, does repair sneakers. So he started to and I think a few of the cobblers, I guess, are, start, are starting to think about that. But he um, sort of patches them if people have a hole in the toe or things like that. So I think um, it's nice that those sort of very tradi traditionalist um, makers are starting to see the importance of this industry as well um which is which is really cool but yeah i think that um that idea of repair is something we need to remember a bit more and i also think in a way because of everything that's happened this year people it is starting to pop up on people's mind again people i think have had a year to sort of reset a little bit and think oh, i'm buying too much or i'm i don't need all these clothes or you know even just of pure practicality you couldn't get to the shops and buy anything new so if you needed to, you know, if you had like a hole in your jacket or something, then then you would have to have to fix it. So it, it went a little bit old school this year, which I, which I quite quite appreciate. Yeah, for sure. It definitely gave us a much needed pause and time to reflect on things. And, you know, this sort of like this mass consumerism of constantly like buying stuff and and, you know, having stuff that we just forget about, don't even unpack and then buy something else. It just, it just got a little bit out of hand. And I think when everybody thought, OK, things are going to get tight, let's not eat out as much, let's not buy so much stuff. And you actually go, oh, actually, I'm not missing this and I'm saving money and, you know, you've got more time to do other things. So I think, yeah, I think this year has definitely given us that yeah. chance to rethink and also reimagine how the future could look and and looking at ways that we can do things better and, and all these sort of things. But yeah, that, that notion of um, taking it sort of like, um, like sort of global yet local type of thing. Do, do you know um, Precious Plastic, the guys who are recycling plastic? It's a guy called Dave Hackins who set up, and, and essentially what, what they did was um, they created sort of small machines that anybody could sort of make, um, and you could sort of recycle 
plastic within your, your community. And he just essentially, it was called Precious Plastic, and he put it online. And once he did that, it's created, I think he's now into the thousands of people around the world who have all started making these machines in order to recycle plastic. And it's really taken off. And I see like what you're doing is something kind of, it, you, it could sort of follow in that way where you sort of set up the blueprint of saying, okay, this is how you can collect. This is how you make, this is the process, this is what you need. And then you could sort of put that online and it, I'm pretty sure like it would just spread. And there's a, there's a sort of map on his website and you can see all of the different map, uh, dots around the world of people who are doing it. And it's, I mean, there's several people who are doing it now in Bali. I mean, we, we did it a couple of years back at, at uh, Potato Head, the, the place I've been working for the, the past six years. Like we set up a lab where we were recycling plastic and also food waste and we set up the machines. And since then, I think there's, a, there's around seven or eight people who have done it just in Bali. So it's it's created a movement and it's 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 making people see the value in plastic again, or, or, the, or so not the value in plastic, the plastic in waste. So that so that rather than just throwing the single use plastic away, they're recycling it and rethinking. Okay, maybe I don't need to buy so much stuff. And there's so many people who have sneakers that could probably do something different with. Or yeah, I think it's a it's a good way of doing it. But have you done anything with um, flip flops by any chance? Because it's a big it's a big problem here in Bali. Like a huge problem. Like every rain, like every rainy season, you go down to the beach and there's literally thousands of flip flops on the beach. And, and we did it. We did a big art installation called Five Thousand Lost Souls, and we we built, um, yeah, we, like an art installation um, that sort of led you into the beach club here. And it was literally five thousand flip flops that we found on the beach and made it into a sculpture. And the amount of people that 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 engaged with that installation were like, wow, this is incredible. It's such a big problem that people don't think about. And I guess it's the same with sneakers. I mean, you're, you know, there are people who's recycling, but how many are in a landfill? Like there'll be, you know, millions, you know, pairs in landfill. So it's definitely a good way of opening people's eyes to like, you know, thinking about where things are heading to and seeing the value or like rethinking what waste means. Like waste isn't something you just throw away. It's a surplus material that if you're creative, like what you're doing, you could do something incredible with them, you know? So, so I think, yeah, looking at ways that you could expand what you're doing to like communities all around the world could be very powerful, something that you've thought about doing. Definitely. I would love to um, come over and do something with all those flip flops. Um, I think it's um, it's so true. And I think especially with flip flops, I mean, there's something about the ocean that I just. It's the I think the ocean ocean plastic and like the pollution in the in the sea is the one thing that moves me more than anything else it's like the thing that i feel like that is my calling to do something about that and i think um yeah flip-flops it's such a massive problem because the thing is the eva that the the, the flip-flops are made out of is such a um sort of a strong material that it's 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 a very useful material but it's it's made for the purpose not to you know degrade or not to lose its um value of its property so even flip-flops that have been swimming around in the sea for years you probably found like those flip-flops that you've that you gathered were pretty much in working order just without maybe the um thong bit at the top or you know the holes have got too big or they've you know, pinged out, but I'm sure with those EVA souls, we could just make some more, make new ones. Yeah, it's funny because everybody, obviously being in the climate such as Bali, everybody wears flip flops. And the, the, the main issue is things, things get lost and then yeah. discarded into the rivers. And then they, then, it, then it just flushes down the river and just uh, that's it. It's, it's out yeah. there forever. And you, there's, there's, I'm, and I'm talking, you know, if you can go down to the beach and look where the, the river mouth is, there's thousands upon thousands of pairs, you know, like you can collect with a small group of people, two, three thousand pairs in one hour. It's, it's pretty sad. It's devastating, really. Um, and there's a, there's a woman here called uh, Lena Klaus, who's an artist who goes and collects them all and does art installations. And she was the one who we connected with. And I actually thought about you at the time. I was saying you would do something really great with these that people would actually rewear. You know, with, with your sort of imagination and creativity, it could be a pretty good project. So maybe I can send you some and you can you can inspire a movement in Bali of what people can do with their flip flops again, because they break. And once they break, you can't wear them again. People just throw them. They break so easily, especially the thong ones. The thongs come out. People can't get them back in and they're like, oh, whatever, just chuck it. And then it's 
that's it, you know. So I think a yeah, cool project around flip-flops could be good. Yeah, it's quite a design flaw, really, when you think about it. It definitely should be. Um, there's definitely something we can do there. Or maybe when we're eventually allowed to travel again, I can come and rescue all the flip-flops and we can do a project together. That would be incredible. And and um, are you seeing much... Um, you mentioned the design flaw and the fact that brands who are producing millions upon millions of pairs of shoes... Which are ending, which are not, um, which are ultimately doing bad for the environment. Are you seeing now brands sort of looking a bit deeper into the types of work you're doing, and we're like managing their waste or looking at ways to become more sustainable? Are you seeing like, especially since you started over five years ago, are you seeing much change between when you started upcycling five years ago up until now, with brands wanting to make changes? Yeah, definitely. I think um, it's been a really interesting progression because I think. When I first sort of emerged in 2016 and sort of showed my collection, I really didn't know um, what people were going to think of it. If people were going to, I just, I just sort of had this burning desire to do it, and then I just presented it and and sort of wanted to see what happened. But I think um, people at the beginning were very sort of anti the idea oh people aren't going to want to wear something that's obviously second hand or that somebody else's shoes you know and all those sort of things and then i think people started to the the first thing that took off was the aesthetic so everybody suddenly jumped on the bandwagon of um that deconstructed aesthetic which was a issue within itself because people were taking the um aesthetic value of what i was doing but n completely disregarding the concept and then making, you know, thousands and millions of, of pairs of sneakers with this deconstructed aesthetic, but then just still mass producing them and not giving anything a second thought. So so when that sort of kicked off around, you know, 2017, that was it was really hard for me because I really was conflicted. I was like, I've, I made this idea to change people's mindset and it's just been picked up as a trend. Um, but I think as that's progressed into where we are now, I think, you know, I haven't sort of given up on the idea and I've kept sort of um, championing this idea of waste materials and um, secondhand sneakers. And I think it sort of leaves people to feel accountable for what they're making. And I think the more, the bigger following I get, and also there's a community of us, you know, on Instagram specifically, all these like upcyclists and makers and people that are sort of challenging waste material and saying, look, I can do this with my old stuff or whatever. And I think that that's giving brands no option but to do the same, either by collaborating with us or by trying to do something themselves. But I hope that it encourages more collaborations. And I have found myself that like I have had more brand collaborations, which is good because I think when when I can work directly with a, with a brand and s share my vision is, is much more useful than them just taking what they think my vision is or taking like my aesthetic from Instagram or, do you know what I mean? So I think, um, so I think over the years that progression has definitely changed from like just lifting things to actually investigating um, the ideas more, which, which is good, I guess. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? How people just, they kind of miss the point. They, they just grab the aesthetic and then, you know, not understanding the sort of like ethos behind what it is. It's like you're instigating change and you're doing things for the right reasons. And then brands just go, okay, I'll take that and then try and do something. And it's completely missing the, the point of what it is you're doing, you know? And, and so, so what, what collaborations are you doing then? Are you, are you working on anything in the moment yeah. or? Yeah. So I've had, yeah, I had some brand collaborations in the past, which has been really good. And I think as, um, as I go through this process as well and I learn more about myself and also sort of learn to stick up for myself a bit more, you know, it's just it's just me in the studio on my own, like making these ideas. I have a amazing assistant now, Matthew, that started working with me. But before that, you know, it was just me. So I think um, as I've gone through these brand collaborations, I've started to think, no, I'm not going to stand for that or I'm not going to I need, need to put my foot down a bit more with that because I don't just want to be sort of. <clears throat> taken around brands as a, almost like oh look we're working with Helen so we must be um great so I think that that's I've I started to realize that and now I'm, I'm making sure that um collaborations that I do are really meaningful and um I have had some really good ones and yeah I've got uh, I have got 
a one on that's coming out next year, which I can't wait for it to come out. It's been a long time coming with um with everything that's happened this year. But um also this year it's kind of given me a chance to focus on what I'm doing personally as a brand and like what I'm bringing from uh, my own side without the collaborations and also to think about collaborating with smaller um, brands and people, artists and also people that I, people that I admire and I care about. Um, so earlier in the year I did um, a collaboration with Bethany Williams who makes amazing um, clothes and she's just um, an incredible person and part of our sort of sustainability crew in in London which is great um and you know working with people like that that you ha share a similar mindset to and you you believe in their process I think is so rewarding and um those sort of projects are definitely ones that I want to push further um hopefully next year if everything gets a bit back to normal yeah and I guess that's the whole thing with collaborations it's kind of that's what collaboration should be about, right? There's a meaningful purpose to why two people are coming together and complementing each other and creating something that you couldn't do without the other. And I guess the attraction of working with big brands is it's it's kind of, I guess people are using it more as a platform to try and get their name out there. And it's kind of, it's, a, it's turned into a marketing thing, I think, a lot with these bigger brands. They're like, you know, like what you're saying, it's okay, well, we need to be look like we're doing something meaningful. Let's just get Helen in and take that box. And ultimately that shouldn't be the goal of, you know, if they're serious about it, they should try and implement something and have a bit of a goal that they want to reach and then bring you in to really kind of like collaborate deeply on that, on those systems, you know, rethinking how they, what they're doing with their waste and look at it as a long term thing and not just some short term box ticking sort of thing, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the thing as well. And that's something, especially all us sort of young designers that are working in um, sustainability and sort of changing um, attitudes and mindsets towards products in the fashion system in general. I think we we started to become more aware of that and to realize that um the value that we bring is massive and i think that's it's it's hard to to see that sometimes because you know exactly like you said you know you get get these approached by these people you're like oh amazing that will boost my followers or that will do this or that will do that but um if you want to keep the integrity of what you're actually trying to do then um it can be quite tricky to navigate that and to to work out you know how to um how to grow whilst keeping that sort of authenticity and making sure that your message and the thing that you're you believe in doesn't doesn't get lost along the way really yeah it's so important absolutely and and in terms of what you're doing then because it is you know by nature a small scale operation you're making everything by you know by yourself in your studio um one off pieces is that for you something you can st sustain financially like is or is it something you feel you'd like to grow slightly, like, I wouldn't say scale up huge, but are you looking at ways of expanding this? Um, it's interesting because when I first started in, so when I graduated from RCA, I actually worked at Adidas for a year. And then I, um, after a year, I decided to leave and come back and set up the studio because of, you know, wanting to take ownership of this idea. And then um, when I kind of set up the studio, I almost said to myself, oh, I'll give it a year and see what happens. Didn't really have a plan, didn't really have much money, was just sort of like going for it. Um, and then after a year, I was like, right, okay, I'll give it another year because it's still sort of working. Um, so then I did it. And then that took me to sort of the beginning of last year. And I was like, right, okay, this is actually my business. This isn't just me faffing around making a shoe. So I think this year specifically has been a real transition period into me thinking, okay, if this is going to be my legacy and this is what this is what I'm bringing to the world and you know, just thinking a bit more about what are my goals, like what are those things that I want to achieve and and how am I going to get there? So I think yeah, I've started to to think differently about it now whereas before i was really against scaling up in terms of like you know mass producing things or anything like that which i still still don't want to do but more thinking alternative ways of um making the products more accessible or making more people be able to be inspired or influenced by what i'm doing if it's through you know talks and workshops or just different ways to build the business rather than just um you know, making the made to orders because made to order takes me about a week of time to do one pair. Um, 
so it's very time consuming and also takes so much creative juice to be able to do it that you feel sort of exhausted after doing one so i think um although it's the crux of the business and i definitely want to keep it going i'm sort of um i'm starting to think now about other ways that i can expand and just share 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 it with people really because exactly like you said earlier you know this idea of open source and this idea of inspiring people to help themselves or to take ownership themselves i think is is the way forward and i think the idea of um self worth and sort of you know um it just it just doesn't make sense to me to just grow a brand for the sake of growing it does that make i know it sounds strange hey, no that I makes mean, that I, makes complete sense yeah i mean with what you're doing it's purpose driven you're not yeah. just making it just to make money you're doing this because yeah. The, there's, a, there's a meaning and a purpose behind what you're doing. You're trying to implement change. You're, you're, you know, you're kind of like, there's a big, big problem with waste, not just in footwear, but within the whole world of this, this, this sort of like um, culture we're in of like everything is just throwaway. As you said before, you, it's cheaper to buy something new than to replace what, or, or to repair what you already have, which is a disaster really. And right now the world is a breaking point and we need to really make changes. And I think you're one of the, the few people that are really um you know for me sort of creating that impact where i can see this really taking off like because like one thing sneakers are, there's just something about sneakers that people are just really as you mentioned almost like emotionally attached to and the stories and the narratives that come with people remembering what the sneakers that they had when they're younger or those sort of like moments and then the fact that you're sort of taking all of these different um sort of memories and different eras and sort of deconstructing and put them in something new and go look how beautiful this is and it's made from waste. And I think it's very, very inspiring, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I think it's kind of to, to be scared of scaling that up, I think is, I, I know I, th I would be proud of that. I think, I think if, if you could scale that up, then what, a, what an achievement, because how much, how much uh, the legacy of, you know, doing your part in help saving the planet would be huge, you know, because, because landfills and throwing things away in the, into the into the oceans it's a big big problem so the more people that can do this if everybody did it it would be amazing right yeah it would be good wouldn't it um yeah i think that's the thing as well i think it's just um those stories and that i think um that connection is what sort of drives me and i'm 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 always in, i'm inspired by people you know and people's stories and i think that that maybe sets apart like what I'm doing to um, other um, customizers or people that are working for, you know, that are inspired sp particularly by the products or by um, the sort of franchises and the brands and that sort of thing. Like none of that is not that it's not relevant, but it's, it's not the thing that's driving me. And um, yeah, one of the made to order services that I do, people can actually send me their old sneakers. So people can send, I say up to six pairs of their old sneakers and then I'll remake them into, into one pair of shoes for them. So people have sent me like their first ever basketball shoes or their shoes they wore to the prom or like all these different um, elements that of shoes that, you know, you might buy for one occasion or you might wear or you grow, grew out of them or those sort of things. And then I can take little pieces of them and like rework them into a new sneaker for somebody to wear. And I just think that is a lot of pressure because you have to really pay homage to their story. But it's um, it's also an amazing thing to see when they open the box and they have all those memories in their new products. So it's really nice. That's incredible. Yeah, and that sentimental value that people have. I wonder what it is about sneakers that people, I wonder if there's like a science behind it to why why we do have such a big thing with sneakers and compared to like a t-shirt or a jacket or whatever. And yeah, I wonder, I wonder what it is about sneakers that we get really emotionally attached to. Is it, the, is it just this kind of the fact that we walk on our feet and this, or is it just an aesthetic? I don't know. I, I, is that something you've looked into? Why people are so emotionally attached to these these objects yeah it's something i'd love to explore more and i do think even though it sounds obvious i do actually think that idea of walking and like a physical journey it is a part of the attachment and i think like with your shoes i don't know like i have a pair of um adidas sambas that have got a suede toe and i the toe's got a mark on from where i spilt a sambuka shot on the toe when i was like 18 and i think 
those sort of memories that you I think because you if people really do wear their shoes and you know enjoy wearing them and aren't too precious about them you don't think about it it's just there and then you you know you notice like oh that scuff was from a gig or that was from when somebody you know spilled a drink on me or whatever it is and then you have um and even the the outsole you know the the way you walk is impressioning your body and your um movement into the grain of the tread so i think that the, even those sort of things are it's just becomes a really personal object and i think that um also a sneaker it's like it's small it's an object it's like this thing that you don't quite understand it's not like a, a t-shirt or something that seems more um more accessible i guess like i think sneakers especially in culture as well have always been built up to be this sort of grand um thing that people aspire to own or aspire to have or is connected a lot to culture and music and i think that those those reasons as well make it a lot more um powerful i guess um but yeah it is so interesting i'd love to i'd love to know know more about it and i think i think i was really surprised in a way when i when i first realized that people wouldn't give me their shoes i was like oh come on it's just your shoes and then i realized i was asking everyone else for my for their shoes and i wasn't taking mine and i was like if i'm not even going to cut up my own shoes how could i not how could i expect that anyone else would let me cut up theirs and you know i have like old converse from that I used to draw on or people would write messages on and I think I've always just had that that connection with products and just personalizing stuff and I think I'm just I guess I'm doing that on a on a bigger scale mm, that's very interesting and and I always you know like when you you you, you see someone I always remember at school you'd always sort of like people i wouldn't say judge people but you sort of like get an impression of what someone was like by the sneakers they were wearing you know it's kind of got this real expression of you can almost tell what he or she likes because of the shoes she's wearing and then as you mentioned it's so connected with culture like music cultures and in the 80s you had the adidas kind of terrace culture and in the 90s you had you know different things with nike and yeah i guess it's sort of like an identity isn't it like these are the shoes i wear because i'm part of this type of I, I don't know belonging somewhere or a scene or a movement yeah. or something so I guess maybe that's what it might be yeah it's an interesting thing to to think about I think it's all of those things mixed together and I think people have um it's just one of those objects that can um people can relate to it for so many different reasons so whether it is through like you said like those cultural references through um something to do with the brand that's always been like an aspirational brand to with sneakers I think it's it is it can be all of those things. It can be, um, you know, it's aspirational. It could be aspirational brand. It could be something to do with um, a sort of um, cultural figure or celebrity that's like endorsed something. So I think there's there's just always so many versions of why people can be connected to um, to it, which is more more than other items of clothing, I guess. Absolutely. And and you mentioned earlier about sharing things, and if somebody does want to do this, like for themselves at home, um, did you say you you have some workshops online that you're uh, maybe people can access? Yeah, so I'm hoping to do um, more next year. I've done a couple of um, ones during lockdown, you know, on Instagram Live and and things like that, but I haven't done any that are um, that exist that people can look back at, but. Um, I do sort of, um, I do do them occasionally on Instagram live and I'm hoping that next year, um, maybe to do a sort of series. So there's a bit more something that, you know, is more accessible to people, but, um, but yeah, I think the best thing to do if people are interested in, in working with their products that they own is just to, um, just to have a go. I think the, the, I always, um, just encourage people to just you know if you've got an old pair of shoes that you don't mind or you're gonna throw away that that you want to do something with just just have a gut you know take a scalpel to it and cut a bit off and see what happens I think it's um sneakers are pretty robust and pretty um hardy so you can you can go for it and it's not going to um you know it's not going to fall apart straight away even if you you know cut a few of the um 
pieces off like the reinforcements or if you move something to somewhere else or another thing you know is even just th thinking of things like changing the laces or painting on them or um, those sort of um, easy fixes are always fun to try and do as well um, but I think just have a go is what I always say because um, and I think there's you know on my Instagram you can see the sort of things that I've done so maybe people can find a bit of inspiration there just on a final note, um, just any advice on young designers, maybe that are coming through today or future generations that are kind of wanting to make impact and some, you know, creating positive products. Have you got any advice on people just starting out today? Yeah, I think one of the um, the most important things that I've sort of realized recently is to to make sure you know what your purpose is for for doing what you're doing. like. Um, and then you can you can focus in better on, on what you're trying to achieve. And I think um, as well as that, build... I remember at uni, people always used to say to me, oh, build a network, build a network. And I was like, what is a network? I don't understand. What does that mean? And I think that um, it's essentially just your friends and like anybody that you're interested in, anybody that you um, are inspired by, it's so easy to connect with people now, especially f through Instagram. You know, I try and um, reply to people's DMs when I can and I try and um, but even if it's not a DM, even if it's just being present on someone's social feed, like where it, you comment or you always like things, you, you'll you be surprised and on how that um, that can people can remember that. I've been in situations before where I've where I've met students and um, then we get onto the subject of Instagram and they'll tell me like their Instagram handle and I'd say like, oh, you always comment on my posts or something. And it's just, um, it connects you then to somebody. And then I'm having a conversation with her over the rest of the group. So I think it's um, be a bit brave and be a bit cheeky on how you might want to reach out to people. And, um, and if you're inspired by people, just tell them, because I think you as an artist yourself or a designer yourself, you know, that is important and it's you've you know it's great to get feedback from people and people to tell you that they like what you do and so just be friendly and be um be enthusiastic about people's work and about your own work and i think it's the it's the best way to start to build a network and start to build a sort of community around what you're doing um i just i believe in being a nice person and being you know sending out good energy into the world Amazing. Well, you're doing a great job at sending out good energy and um, yeah, you, the, the work you're doing is super important and, you know, never more than in today's world. So keep it up. We're huge fans of you here in Bali and we'd definitely love to, uh, to you know, to work on some projects together. So hopefully once this whole pandemic, if it ever calms down, we can come over and we can uh, tackle the flip flops and, 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 and sneakers, which I've also seen in the ocean and in the, in the rivers here. So yeah, it will be great to... Uh, to do that in the future yeah i would love to that would be amazing it was so nice to chat to you i'm glad we managed to yeah thanks so much i really appreciate you taking the time it's been great to connect and uh yeah we uh we'll keep in touch and hopefully yeah. see you soon amazing thanks so much yeah. i'll speak to you soon thank you bye bye